So while everybody is getting um, themselves settled in, if you could share your name and your organization in the chat, um, with then it's a good time to network with each other and you never know who you'll meet. And plus, it helps us to, um, to know who's joined us today. So um, I am Kim Johnson. I provide mobility and commuter programming in Wake County. And we are very excited to see everyone today. The number and variety of employees joining us or attending these events has grown and it's been wonderful. Um, thank you all for joining us and a special thanks to the Chambers of Commerce and the business membership organizations that have helped us to spread the word among their memberships. And I also like to express an extra special thank you to the Southeast Association of Commuter Transportation. Um, otherwise known as SEAC for sponsoring us today. We have um, such a great and diverse group joining us. We can contribute that to the increased participation um, to both the feedback on ideas and questions we've received from, um, from past participants as well as the quality of speakers who have volunteered their time and their expertise um, to share with the group. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to, um, I'd like to introduce Lynn Cohn. Lynn is the Town of Chapel Hill's Go Chapel Hill Community Manager, and she will share a little bit about our transportation demand management program here in the Lynn? Thanks, Kim. And a thank you to everyone for taking time today to join us. We want to start by providing a little background information regarding transportation demand management. Our work as transportation demand management consultants is offering guidance to employers across the triangle for establishing commute options to employees. Services include active bike, walk, and wheel information, as well as providing information to help employees find a carpool or bus route that works for their preferences and schedules. And a very important component for this is that commute options are supported with a free emergency ride home program. This program is further enhanced by Go Perks incentives, providing that extra bit of encouragement to just try a new way of getting to and from work, including telework. All of our consulting services are grant funded and at no charge to employers, both public and private. For more than a dozen years, part of the transportation demand management responsibilities have included establishing telework programs. Before March, telework information was already in high demand. While we continue to provide support to companies with essential workers to safely get them where they need to go, Companies who didn't have telework plans already set up or didn't have strong remote work policies in place have come to the forefront of our services. We are beginning now to see some increase in transit ridership, as well as van pools and car pools returning to the roads. Recently though, we've also heard about some apprehension and low confidence levels that organizations are experiencing and determining how to return to the work site, wherever that might be. The anxiety of the unknown can sometimes result in a loss of productivity. So no matter the company or industry, if you're trying to determine what to do next for increasing or maintaining an effective workplace for employees, the transportation demand management partners are here to assist no matter what the transportation or telework needs might be. We encourage you to contact us by visiting the gotriangle.org employer services page or just click the link in the chat box today to have one of us follow up with you. There is someone yes. in each area of the triangle to serve you. Now it's time for today's program, moderated by Brandy Beaker, the TDM Manager for Orange County. Over to you, Brandy. Thank you, Lynn. Um, 
before we begin, we just want to take care of some housekeeping. So um, just want to remind everyone that you may need to adjust your view options. Um, Gallery is going to give you more of the Brady Bunch feel. Speaker is going to show you who's speaking. Also, speaking of speaking, please um, mute, unmute yourself when mute yourself when not speaking, and which I think all of everyone is that's default. But if you do have something to add, please remember to unmute yourself. Mute, unmute yourself. And we encourage everyone to turn on their cameras so that we feel like we're sharing a space rather than sitting in whatever situation you are in right now. Um, feel free to, um, yeah, feel free to put any questions that you might have as we as you're listening to the presentation in the chat, and we will get to those after the presentation. Um, finally, um, for if you're asking any questions, like raise your hand. Um, during the presentation, check out participant actions and you'll see those options. All right. So finally, um, but before we move into the session, um, I just want to let everyone know and sort of highlight the fact that this session is not a political conversation and that the hosts and the presenters do not make policy decisions. So we are respectfully asking that our participants refrain from questions that are political and beyond the scope of our presenter. Our intent today is to engage in a conversation that is informative and provides valuable insight to enable our employers, employers and employees to return to the work site safely and with the timeline that is best for their circumstances. So thank you all for following that. And with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker, um, Dr. John Staley. Dr. Staley is the director of the North Carolina Occupational Safety and Health Education and Research Center and is a faculty member of the Gilling School of Global Public Health at UNC Chapel Hill. He has over 20 years experience as a public health policy and management expert, and we're so happy to have him speak with us today. He currently works as co-investigator on Carolina Prosper, a North Carolina po policy collaborative funded project studying COVID-19 to assist business businesses during the pandemic. Dr. Staley, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready, Brandy, thank you. Okay, all right, thanks. <clears throat> thanks for the introduction, Brandy. Yeah, my picture there was a a little bit younger, a little more innocent, a little more hair on my head, but that's okay. <clears throat> so I actually, um, yes, I work with the North Carolina Occupational Safety and Health Education Research Center. I know that's a mouthful. We call it OSHRC. And I also teach courses within the Gilling School of Global Public Health at, at Carolina. So uh, I came here uh, from, well, I'm from North Carolina, but I was at Kent State University, Northeast Ohio for about 10 years prior to coming back here and uh, we lived in the snow belt up near Cleveland and I've never seen so much snow and nor do I ever want to see that much again. So I'm glad to be back. So I want to give you a little bit uh, just a background here on, let's see if I get this to, there we go. <clears throat> background on what we do, uh, the Prosper study briefly and, and then going into our, our work in, uh, during the pandemic. And things to be thinking about is businesses are trying to maintain being opened or reopening things of that nature. Well, Osher Center is one of 18 NIOSH funded research centers across the country. We're actually one of the oldest. We're about 42, 43 years old. So we have a long history of doing academic work and uh, outreach and education around issues of occupational health and safety. So we have ac academic programs in, uh, in occupational exposure science and epidemiolo occupational epidemiology at UNC, uh, ergonomics at uh, North Carolina State University and occupational medicine at Duke University. And we also have a total work health certificate, which kind of frames our study and our COVID project we're doing now. And I'll talk about that briefly. So, and as I said, we do a variety of continuing education things, you know, so you think about whether you're uh, getting continuing education credits for your uh, asbestos, lead, certified industrial hygienist, safety professional, all that good stuff, right? Okay, so, well, Carolina Prosper, that uh, stands for Promoting uh, Return uh, uh, Safe Practices for Employees Return. So, Essentially, this emerged from the funding through the CARES Act that provided funding for a variety of projects to help simulate and, and help us work through the pandemic. We all realize that it's been a challenging time for 
since March, it seems, I mean, you know, if you're like me, you've been in one long Zoom call, it sometimes feels like since March, right? But in Carolina Prosper, we're essentially, we take this total worker health approach, again, I'll talk about in just a moment, and we are specifically working to provide technical assistance to businesses in North Carolina, primarily around the Triangle area, the 10 county area there, uh, but with future plans to keep expanding because there's a lot of need, obviously, uh, for the business community. And then, so these are a few of the things we'll talk about and I'll just move on. So um, I just want to show you this slide. It's kind of a nice slide just with one on the top is the COVID-19 timeline. You know, so we think back, way back to January, um, which may seem like a lifetime ago, go, but the World Health Organization declares it a global health emergency. And then we start progressing. If you remember in March, I certainly do because suddenly my kids were uh, staying home, having school at home. I started teleworking right in the middle of teaching at Carolina. <clears throat> and we entered that initial lockdown, if you remember. So we've seen a progression there across the top and you can kind of look through that. Along the same time, and, and, and the bottom of the graph, or the, the figure there, you see our Prosper timeline. So uh, Congress passed the CARES Act, and then the funding comes through to the North Carolina legislature that then is funneled to the Policy Collaboratory in North Carolina that has funded a variety of projects across the state, including ours. So about uh, mid of the year, about August, uh, we started onboarding our staff and making our plans for the study. And one of the last slides I'll show you just has a snapshot of our team and our principal investigators. I'm a co-investigator on the study or the project. And we started off by launching really a uh, COVID-19 impact study for work sites to see, hey, what's going on in your work sites? How are you doing? How does this change things? You know, it's so quick as we remember, you know, you might have started off seeing no one with masks and then you, you go to the grocery store uh, or a shopping center and one or two people have a mask and then a few more and a few more and then it's like, are we going to see that in the workplace or not? What do we need to be doing? A lot of questions coming up. <clears throat> so our survey gets it asking how that worked. And then now in the November, December, we're in the middle of providing technical assistance to businesses and we have particularly uh, focused uh, our initial efforts with small and me medium businesses because they've been hit uh, disproportionately um, in terms of being impacted by the pandemic. So I mentioned total worker health, and this won't be a total worker health NIOSH lecture, but just briefly, essentially what this is, is kind of like what it sounds. Think about policies, programs, practices that get around integrating protection, uh, including not only traditional occupational safety and health, but more of your health promotion efforts to advance more of worker well-being. So think work-life balance. So the old adage used to be for occupational safety is the employer leaves the workplace and they are worse than they started off. But with total worker health, you have opportunities to do things, hopefully, so the worker could leave being in better health or having more resources uh, to improve their health. So that's what we use as a framework for that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So obviously I put a snapshot here looking at recently uh, data from North Carolina from the New York Times uh, as well as the case counts by county. I, and we're all familiar with uh, the COVID cases are increasing but we had about at least 31 new coronavirus deaths and over 6,000 new cases reported just on December 6 alone. So it continues to progress. We're seeing that increase as was expected <clears throat> after Thanksgiving. And so a significant increase, actually about 34% uh, more than about two weeks ago. And so, and, and then um, the slide on the right, or the picture on the right just shows the concentration of uh, cases per county per 100,000. So essentially you think about that and then the framing within, there's over 15 million cases in the U.S. And there's been, we're approaching uh, quickly 300,000 deaths in the U.S. And as I said, I mean, this is not only affected workplaces in North Carolina, as you know, but all over the country, all over the world. 
Um, but smaller businesses, seven in ten, out of 10 of those um, have been particularly adversely affected by the pandemic. Very challenging for them. And as we see, the numbers are continuing to rise uh, as far as North Carolinians who have applied for unemployment. And as of today, this number is actually a little higher than 1.3 million. Um, and this is the data that goes back to March when we started the first steps with uh, shutdowns and closures, if you remember, so March of this year. <clears throat> One thing I thought I'd briefly uh, I just share with you is just kind of the vaccine update as a framing as going into thinking about preparing to open your workplace just with um, what's happening because there's a lot happening really quickly as we're seeing on the news. As a matter of fact, today there's an independent advisory committee that is reviewing, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the vaccines that, uh, that are currently being prepared for market. To, um, to do some final reviews for safety and make sure the effectiveness is there. You know, we've, we're still learning about the long-term effectiveness versus, you know, it's one thing to think of efficacy, lab efficacy. So it's like the perfect circumstances, uh, you know, ideal controlled in the laboratory versus effectiveness, which is obviously our real world conditions. And a lot of factors come into play. And this is a challenging thing when we're thinking about this, you know, when is it coming? To North Carolina or other states well certainly in North Carolina it, it's it's hard to, to say we, we think we're gonna start seeing that coming probably anytime here towards the end of December to January but that depends on certainly that meeting today that would allow emergency the EUA or emergency use authorization um, for the two vaccines and there's a lot of things that go into place into that when we think about the logistics of or how you're going to deal with having it here and being prepared for when it comes. Um, and so we'll think about, you know, who, how much will North Carolina receive? Who's going to get it first, second, et cetera. Um, you know, you, you've probably seen in the news, the, the, uh, the two vaccines are particularly uh, challenging to transport and disseminate when you think about this. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, it really frames our thinking with the plan that North Carolina has, and this is very similar to other states, with going through the progress of what's expected over the coming months into maybe the middle, mid-2021. Uh, so certainly the plan is thinking first um, that the drugs, well, let me back up, that as I said, that one of the difficulties to think about how long is it gonna take to get here and how we're gonna handle it, the difficulty, you know, the Pfizer drug, the Pfizer vaccine has to be stored at uh, minus 70 Celsius, which is, um, that's about 94 degrees below zero. So your traditional freezers can't handle that at laboratory and hospital sites. But the Moder Moderna um, vaccine is a little bit better, about minus four Fahrenheit. So that can be kept in regular freezers. So hospitals will probably be the sites most likely that the vaccines are first brought to to then be given, because they can be stored in these uh, deep freeze freezers, given to healthcare workers, uh, as well as, uh, so think of your doctors and nurses that are on the front line working with COVID patients first. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we think about long-term care staff, as well as the residents, because we know uh, the residents of long-term long -term care facilities are particularly at high risk and so that will be, uh, when you think about skilled nursing facilities, places like that. And then it would regress into what they call from 1A to 1B, going into a uh, little bit less, but still a high, highest risk of severe illness outside of that, <clears throat> and highest risk for exposure. So think about people with chronic conditions. So underlying conditions, um, uh, uh, chronic obstruct obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, sickle cell disease, heart conditions, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, things of that nature. But adults would also, in this category, be your essential frontline workers. So think police, uh, food processing, teachers. Teachers are in that queue, which is good to see. My wife is a teacher. <laughs> and then we progress into, <clears throat> excuse me, adults at high exposure with, uh, and, and, and increased risk of 
So we, you know, we get into more healthcare workers, expanding out people living in prisons that are uh, high, at risk population, homeless shelters, um, migrant workers, things of that nature, uh, adults over 65, but younger than 75. And then as we progress out, you, you, it gets farther out with then college and university students, uh, K-12 students, uh, and then, then finally everyone else that did not meet any of the initial criteria. So you, you can kind of look at this at a moment, for a moment. You may find yourself in any part of the spectrum here, or you may not know, and that, and that wouldn't be surprising. And the challenging thing too with this, you know, if you look at um, recent surveys, only about 61% of the US population has said they will get the vaccine. Um, there's a lot of lack of trust, obviously, right now um, with the process and government. And, but what's particularly disconcerting, people that have been uh, disproportionately impacted uh, by the pandemic, uh, like racial and ethnic minorities, well, they're even less likely to uh, say they're going to take the vaccine because of the still a deep and still distrust of uh, the healthcare system. So we're working to combat that in public health and healthcare, for sure. Okay, so reopening factors. Uh, so we had that framing, and oh, in that vaccine process, so you're looking at those, um, those phases starting December, then into January, February, probably people I know, like my parents that are in their early 70s might get it about mm, March, April, and then the rest of us probably get it May, June 2021, if everything is approved and goes up according to plan with the emergency use authorization. So when you're thinking then about your workplace policy, your plan for educating, notifying your employees, you know, that's a very important thing up front. And if at all possible, we need to be thinking about really doing a risk assessment of your workplace. Now, in, in traditional settings, that's been more common and more occupationally or risky workplaces that are higher risk for issues with occupational health and safety. Maybe higher risk for slips, trips, and falls, like for firefighters, law enforcement, or uh, people working in healthcare settings, uh, things like that. But you need to be thinking more about, okay, first, what are the hazards in my workplace? Because one of the things we have seen in this total worker health approach is that traditional occupational safety is, and health issues have kind of taken a back seat to COVID, right? And some of that out of necessity, and it, we know it's, it's even worked its way into our private lives with our personal lives with many of us, what, have delayed getting health care, maybe uh, going to the dentist, getting new glasses, things of that nature. So we have to think about doing a, a, a risk assessment or a workplace hazard assessment, okay? Um, so, you know, there's a variety of things that you start thinking about. Are we going to continue teleworking? A lot of people are teleworking, but then a lot of people are not. And this is a challenging thing when we think about this and reduced hours and shifts, because you've probably heard it said often that, hey, we're all in the same boat. We're all together in this. Well, I like what I, I can't remember who it was I heard talk with the American Public Health Association presentation on vaccines, but it's like, well, no, we're not all in the same boat. We're all in the same ocean. But some of us have bigger, nicer, more comfortable boats than others. So many people that have teleworked have more often than not had a, a little bit easier. Not always. I mean, I've had a lot of interesting times teleworking and having my family, my kids here, my wife uh, teaching from home. But versus many essential workers that are working in food service, retail, things of that nature, that may be very low uh, income and are also higher risk for complications from COVID. So we start thinking about then how you need, you need to certainly be thinking about protections for your workers. And it goes beyond just, you know, the wearing the face covering, wearing the mask, but who are your at risk workers? If you're not thinking about that, you definitely need to be doing that now. So who are people that may have chronic health conditions? Uh, that even would fall under some uh, American with Disabilities Act um, requirements. But, you know, most likely if somebody is suffering from heart disease, 
kidney disease, type two diabetes, things like that, they probably would be considered, uh, oh well, they'd be considered an at-risk worker and fall also under some ADA protections. Also, think about your vendors and contractors and your customers, right? And what you're gonna do there, um, not only to protect them, but to protect your workforce from vendors and customers. We've seen plenty of instances, right, that of customers being, shall we say, reticent to wear masks and being challenging to some workers in workplaces. And an important thing we think about right from the beginning, you need to have a trusted individual in your company be your gatekeeper. And I always love this. And my, I know my students, my, my kids certainly roll their eyes when I do my best Gandalf from Lord of the Rings. You shall not pass, right? It's, you have to have somebody that is single conduit for the information coming in. Being the fact checker, getting information from trusted sources, WHO, CDC. CDC has gotten much better with this now recently. Uh, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, your local health departments. Good, trusted information and a sole source of information. So we, we reduce the chatter um, among employees and relying on our coworkers, relying on our family's knowledge, things of that nature. Whoops. Also, we gotta be considering, you know, what are you gonna do when employees get sick or Maybe they're symptomatic. Uh, I went through this recently. I had some COVID-like symptoms, went through multiple COVID tests, didn't have it. I thought it was allergies. My doctor was very thoughtful and very thorough, but not all uh, populations will have uh, that type of accessibility that I've had and others have, right? And some of this comes into play when we think about, particularly for uh, low wage earners, um, protections per the uh, Family First Coronavirus Response Act. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But you have to think about, one, are you quarantining asymptomatic workers? Well, you may need to do that, and you should do that. If somebody does um, present as being COVID positive in your workplace, one thing, you're not required to share that information, you know, who's the specific person, um, nor should you for confidentiality reasons. But as an employer, but you certainly would want to think about if there's any workers that have been in close proximity to that worker, they may need to quarantine. And you certainly need to send home people that are showing symptoms. So we think about kind of backtracking for a moment with that workplace plan and that gatekeeper. It's a good idea to be doing the daily checks, having employees do daily self checks. Do I have symptoms? Am I feverish or do I have a fever over 100.4 degrees? Um, or having a person doing a temperature check that's trained to use the thermometer correctly. Thankfully, we're past the day of the mercury thermometers that people like me used to like to break open and play with because we didn't know how hazardous it was, right? But certainly, we have to think about then sending home the symptomatic quickly. And you need to make sure you call your uh, local health department where you're doing that. Now, some businesses I know certainly have been asking, are you offering or should we offer SARS-CoV-2 virus testing? And just some little background on that. You know, we, we hear this and COVID-19 said interchangeably, but just remember, SARS-CoV-2, that's the specific coronavirus that, that causes this type of a sudden acute respiratory syndrome. COVID-19 is the actual disease you develop from that virus. <clears throat> so, but you have to think about, are you gonna offer testing? You know, sometimes that can be a rabbit hole that uh, businesses may not want to go down, but certainly you want to uh, avail your employees of the resources of where that's being done. And is it antibody testing, antigen testing? Um, and, you know, is it effective? Uh, it's increasing and improving rapidly, which is great, uh, particularly helping with contact tracing, but it's not perfect, obviously. And as I said, you know, the gatekeeper, not only for the gatekeeper of your, your organization, but we have to think about educating the workers, staying up to date with the most relevant information that you'd be sharing from, again, giving them trusted resources. <clears throat> now I said the Family First Coronavirus Act, uh, I'll jump to that here in just a minute, because that, that's a big one. 
as I said, you have to be thinking about the overall safety still of the workplace. Uh, question often comes up is, well, where does OSHA come into play? Or really it's the Department of Labor, whether it's federal labor or North Carolina Department of Labor. Well, the uh, Department of Labor still expects a safe workplace. Right? The general duty clause of the OSHA Act still says it's expected that a workplace um, will be free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm. So if there is COVID recognized is in your workplace, then that could become a violation of the duty, general duty clause. But I mean, if you're doing your due diligence, more, more often than not, you would be fine. But you also need to be thinking about those other hazards, as I was saying. And I'll show you a tool here in a moment that maybe helps us a little bit with that. <clears throat> Uh, particularly with we think about work specific hazards you know whether you know if you're a construction industry you have a wide variety of hazards versus if your workforce is typically in the office space primarily right but what about if it's in you know a mix or a hybrid i said that family's first coronavirus response act this was building on uh, the family emergency leave act <clears throat> and that was passed by Congress. Interesting thing, it's coming up uh, to expire at the end of December, but, you know, we expect it's going to be renewed. Uh, you know, if you looked at the history of that, it has strong bipartisan support, seen as a very good thing for ensuring if people were sick, they could go home and not spread the disease, not have to worry about being uh, losing uh, their wages and making those tough decisions. Do I go to work sick or do I come home and not have food for my family? So this uh, law applies specifically to businesses with less than 500 employees, uh, as well as there's some other stipulations for eligible employees. So, you know, healthcare workers do not typically fall in this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, your first responders, uh, do not fall within this, as well as government employees, typically. There's other things for protections for them. But so businesses with less than 500 employees, um, there is uh, that mechanism from the government. And if you reach out to the State Department of Labor, it's a great resource, and I'll provide it to the team here to, to share with you guys, uh, that can help answer questions about that for providing uh, tip, uh, norm is eight up to 80 hours or two weeks approximately of paid leave for employees as well as a certain percentage for part-time employees of which the employer is reimbursed through this act as i said it's supposed to expire at the end of december but we expect it's going to uh, be renewed other factors to think about the health and well-being right the mental health, the mental health, the mental health. This has been a, really a struggle for everybody. And the teleworking, you know, working from home and thinking about planning for your return to work, it's a challenge. You know, the, the pandemic has changed the face of work fundamentally forever for the most part. And more businesses now are looking at, can we continue to have a segment of our workforce work from home? And that's possible for many businesses, some not. And, but also thinking about that with uh, at-risk populations. But it, it intersects with health and well-being, the mental health of people that, you know, working from home, it works well for some people. They find a better work-life balance, have more time for their family. Maybe they're not commuting an hour, hour and a half each way to work. So they have more time. Their productivity may be increased. But the flip side of that is that there are also people that have found themselves more isolated, particularly people that live alone. And we're social beings by nature. Um, so the one thing in public health, we've been trying to increasingly move from this, you know, it's in the lexicon now, isn't it? Social distance, social distance. But it's to think physical distance too. Because social distancing, we don't want to uh, put that in terms of being, not being in connection with people and your social support. That's really important right now, extremely important. And then the financial. So of not only the business and the employees, and I talk more from the public health 
perspective of that, but certainly, you know, employees, there's unemployment resources, but also the paid leave that then can be reversed and with those eligibility requirements for businesses as well. But we know that this has been a challenging thing when we're thinking about reopening. <clears throat> so I wanted to show you uh, briefly here one of the things that you may, some of you may be uh, familiar with the OSHA Occupational Safety and Health Hierarchy of Controls. And with our total worker health, if you remember a moment ago, I said that gets into um, thinking of holistically, the whole workplace doing a variety of things. The old model, it's why it's an upside down pyramid is that the things that you want to do the most uh, that are most important, you highlight at the top. And the things at the bottom used to be at the very bottom. Uh, where on the left you see encourage, it would say personal protective equipment. And it's the, that was smallest because get, trying to invoke behavior change, get people to wear masks has been challenging, hasn't it? We all go to the store, we see masks below the nose, on the chin, sometimes up here. My kids love to do that. <clears throat> so that's the last resort. We want to do that least normally, although there is a face covering mandate right now. So we start, we start with elimination. And then we, so we think about eliminating the hazard. So when you're doing your workplace plan, you think about eliminating this from a, <clears throat> applying this to COVID-19. Can non-essential employees be home, continue to work at home? Many cases they can, but you have to kind of work through that to look at the planning with your plans uh, to go into, you know, are you gonna have to get into substitution? where you get into other methods for interaction. So particularly with the remote uh, work, if there are a lot of Zoom meetings like this are required or you know, Microsoft Teams or WebEx, things like that, to help substitute options for getting together still. And one thing I didn't mention with the, you know, the COVID-19 vaccine for the percentage, the, the people that will take it, the approximate 60%, is this going to be a panacea, a cure-all, once they get it? No. Um, I know a question had been asked about, you know, if I get the COVID-19 vaccine, can I then work safely around people who haven't had it? Not necessarily. You still would want to be taking the precautions that we're taking now because we don't have the long-term data yet on the effectiveness, that real world, for these vaccines. We're seeing some amazing efficacy, high, like 94 95% in the laboratory and we expect with them targeting that protein spike in the virus they, they nailed it but it remains to be seen redesign was what we used to think about with engineering controls so do you need to con consider barriers between your employees and customers having a uh, signage that says go this way or signs that say you cannot go this way one you know one direction in and out um, also, excuse me, you think about the ventilation controls. We've had a lot of questions about ventilation, and that is critically important. And we think about that. Many air design systems that are in buildings were not designed specifically to um, provide good circulation in the midst of a pandemic, the normal diffusing technology. So. We have to think about potential engineering controls and what level can we do? Most businesses can't do a full out, full change of their um, HVAC or heating and ventilation system. <clears throat> then you get into educating the employees. That is so important. I, I've heard people say before, what do I need to tell my employers? I mean, my employees and I'll just do it. I'm like, well, you, need, you should tell them X and Y, but you need to tell them or X, Y, Z, but you need to tell them the why behind it. That's important. They need to know. People went, become much more vested when they're part of it and in the decision making of their education to understand why you're recovering face, why you require face covering or uh, rotating shift hours or pro pro providing whatever protections you're going to put in place. <clears throat> And then we see the smallest. So traditionally, you know, if we don't have to use personal protective equipment, we don't want to. Because, uh, again, that relies on people's individual behaviors. 
which are driven by their own culture, their own values, their norms, and everybody's different, right? <clears throat> so, but right now we're under a mandate for face masks and coverings, which by the way, are not respirators. So when those were required in the workplace, we've had questions. You're not required to have a respiratory protection program for just a face mask. But if you provide N95s, you do. So as we wrap up, and I, I wanna really open it up to allow for time for question and answer to think about, because this is a very big topic, right? There's so many variables at play that we're, you know, we're helping navigate through this together uh, with helping businesses, helping ourselves in public health and the educational system everywhere. This is just a snapshot of our Prosper team, wonderful team with our principal investigators, uh, the other investigators, myself, and then our fantastic project managers and our graduate student assistants. So that kind of wraps up just the formal part here. But if you have questions, there's my contact information. Definitely feel free to reach out to me. It's my email spelled just like my name. It's not Stanley, Staley. So John Staley at unc.edu. And that's usually the best way to reach me um, more often than not. And I'll be happy to, if I can't provide you an answer, I certainly will try to connect you with somebody who can. So, do we want to open it up for Q&A or any thoughts? Yeah, I think it's time. Um, so if anybody, um, we've got a couple questions in the chat, so we'll go through those first. But um, if anyone has any questions, um, again, we do encourage you to turn on your cameras and you can raise your hand by clicking on participants at the bottom of the screen, uh, the Zoom screen, it's selecting raise hand and then we'll call on you. Or you can just put your question in chat if you would rather us ask for you. Um, let's see. So Courtney Schultz asked our first question. Courtney, um, are you willing? I believe she's willing to repeat it for the question. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so, hey. um, John, is there any prediction or advice um, that workplaces will require their employees to receive the vaccine? Um, or, or is there any kind of, I guess, uh, anything that you've heard in relation to that? Or how do we... Uh, I guess, so how do we educate our employees to make them feel more comfortable that they, if they choose not to use the vaccine? Right. Well, that's a good question. You know, in some respects, we liken this to the, the question of, will people get the annual flu vaccine, right? One, and then what a workplace requirement. Now, in some instances, healthcare, uh, the healthcare sector, they may have required it depending on the state and location. And if it's a a union state or a right to work state, um, but also, you know, there are some employers have implemented kind of peer pressure mechanisms, particularly sometimes in healthcare, to encourage people to get the flu vaccine. Um, so when you think about this, that one, the coronavirus, this coronavirus being novel, it just hasn't behave, behaved for the most part like anything we've seen before right? It may not be the last though. But with that, it's, I, I think there would be a variety of things that would come into play that would prohibit an employer to directly do that, to require it, nor would, I, I would think that wouldn't be the best approach. I mean, you certainly want to think about like within that hierarchy I showed, the education to show the effectiveness, how safe it is, because right now it's looking very safe. And we'll find out more after this independent advisory committee releases their findings after this meeting today. And it's really about sharing information, I think, Courtney, with um, employees about where are the trusted sources and where you, can you get the information that we know there hasn't been as recently as much trust in government as in the past. But there's still within the public health sector uh, vetted, very good, clear information that's supported strongly by science. And that's what I recommend using there as a jumping off point. Awesome. Um, we did, we got another question about um, temperature, body temperature, and if 104 degrees mm -hmm. is 
still the benchmark? Um, is, is, that, is that still accurate for people whose healthy temperature is below 98.6? From what that? I understand, and again, that, this is not my specific area, but it is the benchmark. But could that change in the future? Perhaps. I think it's looking at, as a whole, the symptomology. I would not, I, I, I myself would not want to rely just on somebody comes in, there's a temperature check without a self check with your gatekeeper. Well, self check, but also the employer saying, hey, how are you feeling today? Do you have any symptoms? Do you have any pressure or tightness in your chest? Do you feel feverish? Do you feel weak? Are you having aches that are not your normal aches and pains for people, right? Then, then you kind of proceed. So you have to think about that as just one piece of the pie, not the sole indicator. Let's see, Lynn Cohn, did you have a question about the vaccines that you wanted to add? Well, I'm terrible because I always have a million questions. You're not terrible, that's why you're so great. <laughs> but I'll have a, um, a couple of questions. So if for some reason someone is not able to, you know, they're in the first round or the second round and they're supposed to qualify to get the vaccine, but circumstances doesn't allow that, do you know, will they be, you know, will they have to wait until all the other rounds and then they get their place in line again? Or, you know, once your number has come up and you're able to get the vaccine, can you just get it at whichever point you're able to? And then the second question is, oh, is the first and the second dose the same? Or is the second dose a different chemical makeup than the first dose? Oh, those are good questions. I mean, I'm not a immunologist, that is not my specific area of specialty, but in looking at, with the discussions with the state and my colleagues in public health, the vaccine, well, one, I'll, I'll answer the latter question. It, it will be too, it's supposed to be the same, my understanding, but there are other vaccines that are coming on the market and planning to be coming on the market soon that will go under the same, that emergency use authorization review. So. Getting back to your form, the first question, um, if you kind of miss your, your spot in line, the expectation is, is that you still, if you're in a high risk category, you would make it to the front of the line, particularly as additional vaccines are, are coming onto the market, there'll be different options for the people that are then in that phase. But that is something the state still, the Department of Health, Health and Human Services is working out, how they're gonna do that. Because again, the logistics with, these type of vaccines is different than the traditional flu vaccines, particularly with the temperature and its viability. It's very fragile. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Dr. Staley, I was wondering if you could tell us what is, what's the average efficacy of a flu vaccine for, for a normal flu, um, you know, assuming that they've identified correctly uh, the strain that's going to be widest spread. How effective is a regular flu vaccine usually? Uh, that is a great question. <laughs> it, it does vary. And I, 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 I preface it with, I get, a, I get the flu vaccine every year. I really lovingly lean on my students to get the vaccine. And uh, a few years ago, the vaccine I got, the type A strain within it wasn't the correct, correct one. And I got a nasty flu, as did my wife. And we were mm -hmm. taking care of our young kids. Um, the typical efficacy uh, numbers usually about 40 to 50 percent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in a given year, but and, and that's just based on you know it, it's different than the situation now with the coronavirus because we know the exact virus, we know what we're going to target the specific protein, everything. Okay. With the flu virus, you're, you're kind of rolling the dice trying to predict which strains of an A virus, which tends to be more virulent, more nasty, and a, and a B. And they're not always right. It's just mm -hmm. add extra protection in addition to doing the things that mom always taught us to do, you know, washing your hands, don't touch your face, all that good stuff, which I'm, I'm so guilty of touching my face. You know, 
And so okay. it's part of it. we try to get people to think of think holistically that there's not just one fix, one thing that's going to protect you from flu, coronavirus, from a traffic injury, you know, accident, and so on. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Staley. Um, let's see, you mentioned another question we got in the chat, and you mentioned earlier that um, we should not rely on temperature checks solely. Um, so the question was, uh, what um, other organizations are you using to screen their employees? Well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, there certainly is, it really is primarily a symptom check. One, employees doing, it could be the employee doing a self-check or that when the employee comes in, um, they may have their temperature taken, which, you know, it, it certainly is an indicator. If you've got that kind of temperature, you need to, the person needs to go home. Chances are, if they don't have the coronavirus, they've got something that's probably infectious anyway. Um, but that, that's hard sometimes mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of reasons. But check to, checking for all the other symptoms, as well as the, the type of questions that you would be asked in, by a healthcare provider. Have you been exposed to the COVID-19 or to the coronavirus, to the best of your knowledge, or somebody that tested positive? Is anybody in your immediate family or circle uh, showing COVID symptoms? You know, it's a tricky thing when we think about that with, eight, you know, a person can also be asymptomatic for several days. Um, so it's important to ask those questions too, to think, you know, it's best, you know, it's not, true contact tracing, but you're kind of casting a little bit of a net to see has that, your, that employee or yourself been anywhere where you may have been at more risk. If an employee comes in and says, well, yeah, I, I went to, uh, our church was having a singing event, uh, out, but it was outside, but we were all in a small area and it was about 150 people. Mm, well, okay. I'm just throwing it as just an example, and I like to sing, so I probably would be one guilty. Um, but you, you start to weigh all those factors. That's why it's important that the whoever the gatekeeper is, is up on the best, most relevant scientific knowledge, because it does change every day. Thank you. As someone that likes to sing, that, that's been especially hurtful <laughs> during this pandemic. I'm like, gosh. Oh, yeah. Um, we did have um, another question. We had someone ask for some clarification um, from about a statement about N95 masks, and they asked if they heard you correctly that an RPP is needed for N95 masks. Yes. Um, yeah, that's a great question. If an employer is providing the N95, you know, NIOSH approved respirator, that, that mask, or a KN95 if it's an approved uh, respirator on the list, which it might come from China, but there is a list of approved NIO by NIOSH from a variety of international makers, then you are required to have a, a minimum of a, a written protection program, respiratory protection program. You would need to have some type of fit testing in place, whether qualitative, quantitative, uh, things like that. The fit of the mask, testing the fit of the mask on the face. Is that what you mean by the testing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a couple of different ways that you can do this uh, where, um, not to get technical, but some things where you can test to see if uh, you put like a sweet uh, powder close to somebody and see if they can taste it. Or you can do uh, one with what we call a port account. That it's a quantitative measurement. It, it has a tube attached and you actually, you speak through it. You nod your head up and down, and it'll tell you if it's leaking out. And there's a couple of technical things with that, which most businesses would not be doing that because that's really expensive. Let's see. I think there was one more question about how COVID compares to polio. Any insights on that? Hmm. Polio. Interesting question. Um, more often than not, I see if it's compared to anything, well, it's obviously it's compared to flu, but it's often compared to uh, measles with how contagious it is. I think polio is more, I mean, it can be through droplets, but like through water or fecal contamination, things like that, um, that it, it's 
it, it's well with maybe uh, generations my age and older, it will resonate when you say measles. And unfortunately, more and more, more often today, because people, some pockets of people have not got vaccinated, we're seeing measles outbreaks. And measles is very infectious, as, as well as something like smallpox. How should employers be assessing their maximum office occupancy um, during, during this time? Are there any useful tips for assessing what percentage on site is responsible? Right. Um, well, right now, you know, if you look at the current um, uh, requirements with the state, we're still under the still uh, uh, the order with, well, we've got new restrictions with the face coverings, but we're still with maximum of pe uh, 10 people meeting indoors together um, and then 50 people outdoors, right? But this is a really good time, for, one, to be looking at the specs of your workplace, your building the design, how many offices, the square footage, as well as your ventilation system. And that's important that we've got ventilation experts that are working within our project to do that assessing businesses. And I don't say that as like a sales thing, but to say that, that we see that as a very important component that in looking at how are the ventilation system set up? Because it really is with so many of these and I tell my students this, you know, I, I hate it, but professors, we, we say it depends. And it really does depend on a myriad of factors of your workplace. But I would start there first with square footage, uh, what type of work operation you have, and, just, and what necessity do you have first of employees being there in that workplace versus how many could be at, uh, in, an, in another location or at home. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, we got another question in the chat earlier, and I know that it's something personal that speaks to a lot of us since we work in transportation demand management, most of us um, presenting today. Um, but um, are there any recommendations for people to commute using a, a shared mode like rideshare or the bus, um, that kind of thing? Yeah, that, that has been one of the most challenging things with not only, you know, a variety of transportation uh, uh, mechanisms and as well you know for taxi drivers people um you know providing shared transportation you have to think about this as right now still treating everybody as if they might have the flu first and that doesn't mean being rude or socially distant it means taking the precautions so one trying to be as physically distanced in distant in the vehicle limiting the number of people in the vehicle the ventilation, I mean, there, there's some interesting things. There's some things on the market that have come on with separation shields that you can purchase for all kind of different costs that I've seen that separate the driver, uh, the car, or the bus, vehicle from the passengers. And we know this is a real issue, particularly for uh, helping to assist populations that can't get out to get their food, their medicine, get to doctor's visits and need assistance. But some, you know, right now people are scared. I'm like, well, I get COVID if I do this and help somebody. Well, some protective bar barriers and the ventilation is important. If at all possible, having a window down helps a lot with increasing the fresh air, which I know in North Carolina is different. You know, Northeast Ohio, it was cold every day. But here, it might be cold today and then hot tomorrow. But when you can, the ventilation is important, as well as still, we know the virus, the main mode of transmission is not surfaces or fomites, which fomites are like doorknobs, inanimate objects. But still, it does, it can settle the respiratory droplets, the aerosols, on car seats, door handles, and you should be disinfecting your vehicles prior to and after uh, people have traveled in it. Great advice. And I just want to um, point everybody to, Shelly has shared a, a link to Commute with Enterprise, their program. Um, so, and they seem to be in line with those recommendations. Um, so we are nearing the top of the hour. So we're gonna start wrapping this up. And, um, but we do want to make you aware of a survey and a, pro a prize drawing. So we encourage everyone to stick around and to tell you more about our sponsor for today's event. We've got Paul Strahl.
who is the Sustainable Travel Services Supervisor at Go Triangle, and the System Administrator of Share the Ride NC, which is a statewide ride matching website uh, created to help form carpools and vanpools. So Paul, are you there? I am. Yeah, thanks so much, Brandy. Uh, fantastic presentation, Dr. Staley. Thanks so much. We just learned an absolute ton of information there, so thank you. Um, so real quickly, uh, you can see this on your screen. I wanted to talk about um, the Association for Commuter Transportation, or ACT. Uh, it's an international association and the leading advocate for commuter transportation and transportation demand management, uh, TDM, as you've heard earlier. Um, commuting by bus, train, rideshare, bike, walking, or telework improves our world by contributing to energy independence independence, better air quality, livability, mobility, and reduced congestion. So through advocacy, education, and networking efforts, like today's Mission Impossible webinar, uh, ACT strives to improve the lives of commuters, the livability of communities, and the economic growth of businesses. So the Southeast chapter of ACT, or SEACT, uh, we're pleased to sponsor the Returning to Worksite webinar today by offering a no-contact thermometer. Uh, so please be sure to learn more about the Association for Commuter Transportation at actweb.org, uh, where we hope uh, for a better journey for everyone and for a chance to win this prize be sure to complete the return to work survey which you should now see in chat in just a second and I'm going to hand this over to Kim I think the drawing is a pretty tight timeline isn't it Kim um take myself off of mute <laughs> <laughs> it is a tight, um, a tight timeline. Thanks, Paul. I will be sending out um, the announcement with the winner on Monday morning. So be sure to um, to complete that survey and put your name in for the drawing. So you know, um, just with so much uncertainty surrounding the pandemic and some business decisions are just in flux and they're kind of hard to pin down. We have begun to survey organizations as well in the triangle about returning to the office. And so here is just a little bit about what we have found so far, um, mainly that employers across the region are taking different approaches to returning to the work site. What's more interesting is that the vaccine is, isn't what most, mo, what, I'm sorry, the vaccine isn't what was most important in um, their return to the work site. It was actually students returning to full-time classrooms and the governor's executive orders that um, decision makers have said has been most influential. We have also found that the most common adaptation um, for employers wasn't just adding telework, it was reducing the number of employees in the office simultaneously with staggered work schedules and um, by, altern by alternating in office work days. Um, so we're still gathering the data for this survey and just like you saw with the information that we've shared um, through these charts, we don't share any um, personal information. All the data is shared in aggregate and we are seeking input from organizations in the triangle that are willing to share their concerns and plans for safe practices for their employees to turn return to work, and we want um, the situ. We know that. Are acceptable. It is a quick um, survey. It should take about two to four minutes to complete it, and um, it should be completed by a staff member with the ability to answer the questions. If someone that's kind of in the know that can talk about um, work site timelines and commuter parking and parking policies and safety procedures in the office. So we, we do rely on your participation in this survey to assist others and to help us to create um, a stronger, safe, and more informed region as we learn more about um, 
the decisions and about how the businesses are feeling and as we try to overcome this um, pandemic. So please help us out um, by having someone in your organization or have yourself to complete um, the quick survey and share the email um, or the survey link with others in your organization um, or others in the triangle and we will provide the um, information about return to work plans. So um, I will, when I send out the the results on Monday um, for the, the drawing for the thermometer. I will also send out information about this particular survey with the link there. Again, it should be really quick, two to four minutes um, just to complete it. And we would love your feedback. It is, um, we don't share any information um, with anyone, so. We'd love to have you there. And I just want to thank everyone for participating today, for showing up. Um, thank um, SEACT for sponsoring, for providing that awesome thermometer that we get to do the drawing for. Thank you so much. And thank Dr. Staley for um, sharing his wisdom and knowledge with us about COVID-19 and how we can um, become a healthier, um, more productive region. And thank all of my um, cohorts that have helped out, all of the chambers that have helped spread the word and all of our business membership organizations that have done the same. And I hope that you have a wonderful afternoon. It's three o'clock on the dot. And so I will see you later. Thank you, bye-bye.